The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Good morning. morning. Well, we're well into February and soon we'll be in March. Um, For me, March is when spring begins. Up north, it never really begins. Back when we used to do traveling one year, um, our first year we were up there from January to May, and I asked Molly, Molly, when does spring begin in New England? And she said, oh, Jennifer, in New England, spring is just a state of mind. <laughs> but we really get spring down here, and I love seeing the leaves come out on the trees. And um, So we have a wooded area behind our house. And so right now we can see the houses behind us. There are woods in the middle, but beginning about March, the houses back there become more and more invisible. We just look like we have a beautiful wooded lot so uh, until it's that way until Thanksgiving and all of a sudden all the leaves fall at the same time it was a big shock the first year we were here when we saw that well the words to that song that I haven't heard probably in more than 20 years what a mighty God we serve we serve an amazing God And, you know, if you study the Old Testament, the miracles that the children of Israel experienced, we have seen nothing like that. And yet we serve the same God. But it's pretty astounding. And God is really smart and he's very creative. So the first point for this morning, for the message that's called the second day, the first point is God is our greatest weapon. And God protects his children and he loves If you touch Israel, it's like you're sticking your finger in God's eye. Israel, God chose Israel to be his nation because he loved the Jews. He loved the Israelites. And I remember my mother telling me when I was growing up, what, what a beautiful thing my parents did. They always told me the Jews are special. They're God's chosen people. And I grew up with a love and appreciation for the Israelites in Israel. But another nation loved God and chose him, and that's the nation of America. So America is very special to God too. But let's talk about God as our greatest weapon. In the Old Testament, God was the greatest military weapon that Israel had. I mean more than spears and chariots and horses and and vast armies. God fought for Israel. It's pretty amazing. I've got a list here of 41 of the greatest military miracles God did on behalf of the Israelites. I mean, this is the short list, people. These aren't even the smaller miracles. These are just the greatest. And it's a whole page. I had to make the type smaller to get it on one sheet of paper. Amazing. And just a few of them, of course, the pursuit of the Israelites by the Egyptian army when God was taking them out of slavery and out of Egypt. He, God parted the Red Sea. He got them to an impossible-looking place where there could be no doubt that God alone had done this. He parted the Red Sea, and then he did something else. When the Pharaoh and the army pursued, he caused the waters to come crashing out. He wiped out the entire Egyptian army, and he said, They will never trouble you again. Amazing. 
just to have been just to have seen that one just to have seen that one and been able to pass it on to your children can you imagine it makes you wonder how they ever strayed from god these miracles are are astounding and it so it, it was a test of faith i think most of them were pretty scared though except moses but to destroy the whole Egyptian army, never to see them again. No wonder Miriam sang and danced after crossing over to the other side. Then how about Gideon? I love this because God whittled down the people who were willing to fight until he got it down to a small number of 300 men who were selected. And yet, guess what? They didn't even fight. All they did was in the darkness, they surrounded the enemy army and they had pitchers that were stuck inside clay jars and they b broke the jars and the light shined out, torches. torches, and the enemy started fighting one another. They just had to stand there and watch it happen. That's pretty astounding. I mean, that's really cool. So, in Gideon, first, though, the fearful were eliminated because you can't be God's chosen mighty warriors and be fearful. Then, I love this one, King Jehoshaphat. He won a war by sending out a worship team. <laughs> and God said, stand still and see the salvation of your God. Wow, I wonder what's happening when we sing and worship. I wonder what's happening in the spirit realm when we worship God, when we come together in one accord. I suspect some principalities are shaken every Sunday morning when we worship. King Jehoshaphat won by the praises of a worship team. That's 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And then this one. Okay, let me give you the background. This is 2 Kings Chapter 6, verses 8 through 23, a powerful example of God's supernatural help and care for us. The prophet Elijah, Elisha, he was protected by an angelic army. Let's give you the background. Ben-Hadad II, king of Syria, was at war with Israel, and he got really annoyed because God was telling Elisha what the king would be doing. So they were always prepared. So he was really angry at Elisha. So he sent an army to the city of Dothan where Elisha was staying to capture that pesky prophet. Now Elisha's servant Gehazi was terrified when he realized that the entire Syrian army had surrounded the city. They had horses and chariots and their, their um, armor on and their uh, spears and their shields, and they were coming for Elisha. So here, let me read you the scripture. When Gehazi, the servant of, of Elisha, arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. Imagine waking up to that. And Elisha's servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So Elisha answered and said the classic words, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open Gehazi's eyes so he can see. The Lord opened his eyes and Gehazi saw that the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire. What a supernatural experience. I wish I could see the armies now that are fighting on our behalf in the, and see the angelic armies and, and, and everything. And there was a time when we were um, praying. It was Molly, Stina, me, and several other people. And we got a glimpse and we actually saw Jesus on the white horse and the armies of heaven while we were praying. It's amazing. God is amazing. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed, Lord, strike 
these people with blindness. And the entire Syrian army was temporarily blind. Now, they can't see anything. So what does Elisha do? He leads them directly to the Israeli army camp. And you know what happened. I mean, this is kind of sweet. The army fed them and sent them on their way. But the Syrian army never bothered Israel again. That's God's way to fight a war, isn't it? If only we could see the angelic army surrounding us. Now Joshua, in Joshua 10, 12 through 14, experienced what to me is the most amazing miracle of all time. I mean, other than creation itself. Joshua 10, 12 through 14. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of all the Israelites, Son, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. There has never been a day like it before or since, when the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down a full day. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. God miraculously provided 24 hours of light so Israel could destroy the Amorites. I mean, that must have been a great miracle in that day, of course. But now, with our scientific understanding, how could that even happen? I mean, what, did the Earth stop turning? Did it stop in its orbit? I mean, why didn't they lose gravity and everybody just fly off the planet? I mean, how, how amazing is that? Now, to me, that's the greatest miracle of all time. So, if God is our greatest weapon, point two, what does God need from us. If God supplies the miracles, what does he require of those who wait? Well, the first and most important, I think, is faith. We have to believe God. We have to know who he is, understand how great he is, and believe that he will come through on our behalf. How about this? After faith, you need obedience. You need to do what God tells you, right? And then sometimes you need some patience. Sometimes you need more patience than other times. Sometimes you have to be patient for a longer time than other times. In Joshua 6, God told Joshua to have his army march around Jericho once a day for, for six straight days. Okay. While marching, the soldiers blew their shofars and the priest carried the Ark of the Covenant one time a day. I think the, the people inside Jericho were probably confused. On the seventh day, God had the Israelites march around Jericho seven times, then <clears throat> produce a powerful shout, and Jericho's walls miraculously <clears throat> fell down flat. And the Israelite army raced in, conquering the city. But they had to believe God. They had to have faith. And they certainly had to be obedient. Hey, one of the minor miracles in all this is that they weren't supposed to talk or make any noise except for the shofars during this. I wonder how many people there are who struggled with keeping quiet. Can you imagine that? Dennis said when he was a little kid that the teacher asked him to be quiet for a minute. And he said, I give up. <laughs> so God probably had some angels uh, in, mixed in with the crowd putting their hands over the people's <laughs> mouths. Okay. Amazing miracles. And remember... 41 of the greatest ones here. And these are some of the greatest of the greatest to me. 
Now listen to the words of Jesus, what Jesus says about faith. Luke 8, 25, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Not love, not, not any of the other things he could have said, but shall he find faith? Is there anybody out there who's going to believe me? Matthew 17, 19 through 20, Jesus said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will be able to say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, one thing about a mustard seed, a mustard seed is living. It's small, but it has life in it. Even if your faith is small, it has life in it. There's power in it. It's something. Um, it has spiritual substance. Now, Matthew 14, 31. Okay, this is the story of Peter. Remember, they were out in the Sea of Galilee, and a storm had started up, and there was wind and the waves, and they saw Jesus walking, and, and Peter had enough faith to say, Lord, <coughs> let me walk on the water too. And so Jesus bade him to get out of the boat and come walking to him, and he did a few steps. But then he looked around at the circumstances, and he started to fear. Fear sapped his faith. Fear destroyed his faith. And he began sinking into the waves, and Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and lifted him up and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt. And do you know in Indonesia and in some of the moves of God over there um, 30, 40, 50 years ago when they had the great move of the Spirit, we read of people who actually walk, had to walk across water to get where they were going, where God was sending them. I mean, so just the fact that we haven't seen some of these miracles doesn't mean that our God is not able any longer. And I think we're entering a time when we're going to see the greatest miracles of all time because Jesus is coming this time as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming with a roar in his voice. And then in Matthew 8, uh, 5 through 10, the centurion wanted healing for his little daughter and the sin, Jesus said, well, I will come to your house. And Jesus said, I mean, the centurion said, you don't need to come to my house. I'm a man under authority. I understand all you have to do is speak a word and you're obeyed. And Jesus said, well, it says when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith not even in Israel. See, this was a Gentile talking. This wasn't even an Israelite with all that history of the miracles and things. This was a Roman soldier. <clears throat> so the third point is the third day stories of the Bible. The Old Testament is full of third day stories. And I'll explain what I mean. But God works according to patterns based on principles. So we see patterns and principles all through the Bible. Now Joseph's brothers got thrown into prison, but they're released on the third day. Abraham, going to sacrifice Isaac, sees a ram in the thicket to substitute for his son on the third day. Esther, after hearing that her people are going to be slaughtered, Esther fasts and prays. And on the third day, she goes into the king and receives favor in his eyes. Hosea 6, 1 through 2. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up. <clears throat> right in the middle of Hosea, there's a little shorthand for this principle. The dividing line in all history is marked by a third day story. The birth, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus 
time itself was changed and divided into B.C., before Christ, and A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. That's direct naming for the experience of Jesus. That began the year of our Lord. Now, by the way, secular scholars have tried to change it and say, well, they, because guess what? They were offended at Christianity. They were offended at Judaism. They're anti-Christian and they're anti-Semitic. So scholars wanted to change it to BCE, before the Common Era, and after Jesus would be CE, the Common Era. Well, I deliberately don't use BCE and CE because to me that's an artificial affront to God. So in all my books I use B.C. and A.D. to honor the Lord. So, in a sense, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the crucifixion on Friday, the resurrection on Sunday, lie at the very heart of our calendar. And in a sense, it's at the very heart of created time. Crucifixion and resurrection. So see, it's very significant that this is a third day story. Now, in the New Testament, 21 times, 21 times in the Gospels, Jesus told his disciples that he was going to die and rise again. 21 times, at least 21 times. He may have said it in, in other um, less clear language. For example, in the entire chapter, 14th chapter of John, Jesus actually lays out the whole plan for the very first time. It's not talking about going to heaven. It's talking about making a place in the heavenly so he can be our Jesus stairway so there won't be any distance between us and Jesus. We know the kingdom of God is within. We know that, that we were raised up together with Jesus and made to sit in the heavenly places. We know these. We know these things. And John 14 has to be one of my very chapter favorite chapters in the whole Bible, and it starts off, okay, they have just had Passover. They've just eaten a meal, the Passover meal, and of course, Jesus lets them know that this whole thing pertains to me. This whole thing is about me. This whole thing points to me. <clears throat> and so, he tells them, don't be worried. Stuff is gonna happen. In my Father's house, there's room for all my children. We can all be joined to the Lord in the Spirit. There's no distance in the Spirit. We had a, a pastor's wife who was in Connecticut, and her husband was, was, had gone to Heidi Baker's ministry to be involved in Mozambique with what she was doing. And so she was praying for him, and she started releasing a river of love in the Spirit to him and found out later that at the exact time she was doing that, that he felt it in Mozambique. He felt it in Africa. There is no distance in the spirit. And then Jesus went on and he says to Philip, who says, show me the father. He said, well, if you'd known Philip, um, you would have known my father also. But from now on, from now on, you do know him and you have seen him because guess what? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're spirits. Spirits can mingle with other spirits. So Jesus was saying that when you experience the heavenly places with me, my Father is right there and you can know him too. And he says, from now on you do know him and have seen him because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then Jesus goes on to say, say that the Father who lives in me does the works, does all the signs, wonders, and miracles. And he who believes in me will do the works that I do also, and he will do greater works than these because I'm going to my Father. 
And then he goes on and says, a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. How? In the spirit. And because I live, you will live also. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And then in verse 23, Jesus says, If a man loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him. And we, we, my Father and I, we will come to him and make our home with him. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's no distance. And so Jesus was saying, I'm going away for a little while, but I'm not going to leave you fatherless. I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to come back and I'll be part of you and you'll be part of me and we'll be reunited. And it happened fully after the resurrection and after the ascension. And Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to make it a living reality for us. So he laid it all out. I'm just going to go away for a little while so this can happen. Well, do you think they remembered any of this? No. No. Um, I think we need the Holy Spirit to help us remember, and they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. So, as you can probably tell, this particular third day experience was very significant. Now, let me give you the pattern for the third day experience. On the first day, there's trouble. On the third day, there is deliverance. So you have the first day and you have the third day. But you have this in-between part. In the middle, you have the second day. And trouble and perplexity and who knows what else continues. Point four, so what about the second day? The problematic second day. It is a problem, and it has problems. And one big problem is that, for one thing, you may not even know you're in a third day story until the third day. <laughs> it may look hopeless. <clears throat> Let's talk about this second day. This Saturday, this second day, was the only day in the last 2,000 years when not a single person believed that Jesus was alive. That's a pretty sad second day. Now on Thursday, the disciples had thought that they and their master were going to change the world. And then Friday was the day Jesus apparently failed. Saturday was the day their hopes and dreams died. What now? Instead of changing the world, the world crushed their dreams. On Saturday morning, after the crucifixion of Jesus, now they hadn't slept for two nights, because after the Passover meal, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then the soldiers arrested Jesus, and the trial and stuff happening continued all night long, um, Peter, then in the dawn, Peter heard the cock crow and denied Jesus three times. A lot had happened, and they hadn't been to bed. So Saturday, they wake up after getting the first sleep they've had in a while. Thursday, they prepared and ate the Passover meal. There was Gethsemane, the all-night trial, and the crucifixion on Friday. The disciples had experienced the worst ordeal of their lives. So why, why is Saturday even in the Bible? Couldn't this have just been a two-day event? Well, see, there's almost nothing written in the Bible about Saturday. There's all sorts of details about even Thursday and Friday and Sunday. But the only mention of Saturday is that there were some soldiers stationed at the entrance to the tomb. Not a lot of details. As a matter of fact, the most studied days in all of history are Friday and Sunday. 
the days of the crucifixion and resurrection. Probably the most studied, most written about, and discussed days in all of human history. Saturday, zilch. Saturday. This is the day without answers. This is the Friday was the day of despair. Sunday was joy. Friday was confusion. Sunday is clarity. Friday is bad news. Sunday is good news. Friday it's darkness. And Sunday it's light. Well, what do you do on the second day? Imagine the disciples felt pretty miserable. Even went back to fishing. What are we going to do now? The only thing you can do on the second day is wait. You can give up in despair. You can wait in faith. But you have to make a choice. Are you going to give up? Or is there still a spark of hope? Is there still a reason to have faith in something? Jesus had told him the answer. You remember when um, God had the uh, two mountains, the um, Ebal and Gerizim there, and, and he said, okay, now if you, if you do right and choose life, these are going to be your blessings. If you do evil, these will be your curses. And he gave them the answer. He said, I suggest you choose life. God gives us the answers. Jesus had given them the answers. I wonder if there was a single one of the disciples who still had hope, who still believed. I don't know. We'll ask them when we get there. Now, in Daniel 3, 15 through 18, we read about another great miracle. Actually, the miracle is a little bit further on in the verses. Remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is Daniel, and these are his, these are his pals, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king Nebuchadnezzar sets up this huge golden idol, this image, probably of himself, and commands that everybody will bow down and worship this image. And so the music started playing. It was time to bow down. And Shadrach... Meshach and Abednego were just standing there with all these people around them who were bowing down to the idol. And the king was infuriated. He was furious. He told them to take this furnace that they had and, and, and heat it seven times hotter than it was ordinarily and said that anyone who did he'd said that anyone who wouldn't bow down would be thrown into that fiery furnace. And yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just stood there. They weren't about to bow down to an idol. They probably remembered the story of the golden calf in the wilderness and how it did not turn out well for the people who worshiped the calf. So, Nebuchadnezzar, if you do not worship the image, you will be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image you have set up. So he said, God's going to deliver us one way or the other. We serve a God of miracles, and you are not one. They had to make a choice. The disciples had to make a choice. And, you know, I really, like I said, I really am curious to ask them, was there anybody who remembered anything Jesus said? Cliff um, uses a verse that's real int- what what is that verse the one where god pokes his head, this is in the message translation where god pokes his head through the clouds and looks down at the earth and says is there anybody not stupid down there <laughs> i got to find that verse so no wonder jesus 
became frustrated with his disciples and maybe thought the same thing from time to time, he actually used the word stupid a few times in referring to them. Thank goodness it all came flooding back when the Holy Spirit came. Or we wouldn't have a Bible, we wouldn't have anything. They would have forgotten like an Etch-a-Sketch of all the Jesus stories. <laughs> because it was that way until the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> so Jesus actually gives us a third day story, but adds a twist to it. Lazarus, Lazarus, the third day plus a day. That's four days. Well, why four days? Because Jesus wanted to make it extra impossible. See, God wants to get the glory. He wants to come through and everybody knows that only God could have done this. He liked bringing them to the Red Sea where there was no way out and the army was on their heels. It looked impossible. But we know what God did. He parted the Red Sea and then he drowned the army. The third day story with the fourth day twist. See, the Israelites had this belief that it was possible that someone's life could come back into them before the third day. Well, during one days one, two, and three, it was possible. So this is the fourth day twist. So a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha, it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And Jesus said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. If God ever tells you that something is going to happen to you, for the glory of God, watch out. <laughs> now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard it, heard that he was sick, he what? He went there immediately? No. He stayed where he was two more days in that same place. Then after this he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. And after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps but I go that I may wake him up. And the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. Clueless, clueless. However, Jesus was speaking of Lazarus' death, but they thought he was just getting a good night's sleep. So then Jesus said to them plainly, okay, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Then Martha heard that Jesus was coming. She went out and met him, but Mary stayed in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. See, they were believing that he could heal a sick person, but not that he could raise Lazarus from the dead. They doubted. They did not have faith. And she said, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again. She got real religious. I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, I believe you're the Messiah. No wonder he cried. No wonder Jesus wept. You suppose he was weeping because, will I find faith in Israel? So Martha went away and secretly called Mary, her sister, said, teacher's come and is calling for you. And as soon as Mary heard that, she arose and came to him. 
Now, Jesus had not yet come into town, so they were going a distance to meet him. He was at the place where Martha had met him on his way in. And then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, where they saw Mary, said she's going to the tomb to weep for Lazarus, to weep for her brother. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. She repeats Martha's words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews, the professional mourners who came with her and were weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. They made him cry and they made him get, have a stomach ache. Their unbelief. So, Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha still didn't believe. And said, Lord, by this time it stinks, for he's been dead four days. Four days. It was too late for his spirit to come back into his body. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out wrapped in the garments of their unbelief. Jesus says, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? Jesus is still looking for faith. We serve the same God who did all those great miracles in the New Testament, but also throughout the entire Old Testament. God has not changed. We just haven't seen him do mighty miracles like the ones he can do and still will do. If we're starting the beginning of an awakening and we're going to be participating in the greater works and God is going to show off his power before the whole world, I think we better get ready to start seeing some of these mighty miracles in our day that nobody that I know of has seen. Nobody in America has seen some of the miracles that happen overseas, and those are little miracles compared to these miracles. God is coming. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is coming, and he's going to show off, not just in the eyes of the church, but in the eyes of the entire world. And Jesus, amen, amen. And Jesus is asking us, when I come, when I show up on your behalf, am I going to find faith in your hearts? Amen. Amen. I'd say yes to God because we're going to believe him. He's a mighty God and he's going to get the attention of the world and we're going to stand and applaud his greatness. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.